Welcome back to Tiny Blue Games. My name is, of course, Seesaw or Chris, and today we're talking about Final Fantasy XIV in 2020. Today we're jumping into another main scenario quest dungeon. Um, if you didn't catch the last episode where we were talking a lot about the Churning Mist quests, um, and I kind of discussed a lot of the story that happens there, at the very end of the story we do unlock these mana cutter ships, or craft, I guess. We have Biggs and Wedge create them for us. That's that's how it happened. Um, and they give us the ability to fly into the Aerie, which is Nidhogg's lair. Um, and we're kind of doing that with our good Palestinian. And you can already see we do have the attention of some dragons as we fly in with our nice glowing eye. Um, but yeah, so Estinian kind of does a little attack at the start that gets a lot of attention. And you can see the dragon is not, not very friendly, um, but we get kind of hit to the side and sort of lose control and sort of have to uh, descend further and ultimately get separated from Astinian. So it's it's kind of a, a situation where we're trying to climb our way back up and meet up with Astinian to face off against the dragon, hopefully before he is a pile of ash. Um, just before we get too far into the dungeon, I want to give a quick shout out and thanks to Ne Amario. Um, they gave me a quick healing queue for this dungeon, and that's awesome. Uh, not that the queues are actually very long for main scenario quest dungeons, uh, even as a DPS, but it's always appreciated, and I figured I'd give my thanks. So we're going to jump on in here. Right off the bat, I love the aesthetic of the dungeon. I say that, I think, for every single dungeon I play, uh, but they are so nice. They feel so just so big and open, I think is like one of my favorite parts of these dungeons. Like it feels like its own little world um, and definitely anything they do with this kind of crystally rock to this time we have kind of a purpley color, but they do such a good glow effect in this game. Like it really, really amps things up um, for a game that, you know, let's let's be honest, it's dated a bit, but it, it definitely brings the art style really, really well together and it makes things feel unique and interesting. Um, and we'll see as we progress, we do get some more colors as we go through the cave, we get some, some interesting uh, escapes that we'll talk about more when we get there. And then at the very end of the dungeon, a lot of the different pillars and structures are actually crumbling down and like falling and we actually walk in them. It's, it's super cool, but we'll get into that at the end. Um, so stick, stick, stick around. Uh, I should also mention, I guess, that there is some cutscenes at the end of this dungeon that I was smart enough to record. Um, so we'll talk about those as well when we get there. But yeah, let's jump into some trash. I did say in the last video that if you had any questions to ask me, I would try and tackle them as we go through some trash. So I will try and do that. Uh, the first question I have here is, uh, tell us one of your gaming stories. We all have them. Um, a bit of drama or just cool moments that stayed with you. So I was thinking about this one for a while. Obviously, there is a lot of gaming stories that you could go and talk about. Um, this one's kind of an embarrassing moment, and I don't know why, but that sticks in my head more than anything else. It's back in World of Warcraft. It was at the... I think at the start of Cataclysm. At the start of Cla Cataclysm, there was three three raids. I forget which raid it was, but it's one with like a magma worm of some sort. And I was, for some reason, trying to lead a raid for the first time ever, which was already a mistake, because I don't have much experience with that. And we had it so that the leader got all the loot and then distributed it to the you know the highest roller uh, kind of how the loot worked back in a while back then um and i mean so what happened is that i was on a tank uh pally a pally tank um and we killed the boss and there was a pant that drops pants uh for um i would say male i guess because it was it was for a shaman and um, I, I received the loot, and forever I was trying to find these pants to give it to the, the shaman who won the roll. And I just could not find them in my bag. I couldn't find them anywhere. I looked around and around and around, and I was like, I'm sorry, like, I honestly can't find these anywhere. And obviously it looked like I was trying to, like, keep them for some reason, not that I could really do anything with them. Like, they'd be bound to my, my character, who is a plate wearer, so it would not really matter. Um, but it, it looked really bad. And long story short, the next day I went on my character, we were doing some dungeons with my friend and he's like, you are like super squishy. And I was like, that's super weird because I got some new stuff from the raid last night. 
um, go on, look at my character, and I'm wearing some male pants. So the mystery was solved. I had accidentally at some point equipped them, which is really weird because it usually asks, you know, are you sure you want to do this? But yeah, so that happened. I ended up whispering or sending an, a mail to the person and apologizing. Like it was soulbound, so I, there's nothing I could do about it. He did understand it, and like, a, you know, my apology was accepted. But it was, it haunts me to this day. I'm still very cautious with moments like that. But there you go. All right, first boss here. Um, really, really interesting dragon. I really like the kind of the skinny dragon, like the uh, more exotic. I mean, all dragons are probably exotic, but I find these ones particularly exotic. Um, I did look up some of the mechanics for this this uh, dungeon. I don't know. I like. I briefly looked them up. I didn't. I, I kind of read them somewhere. I, I forget which. It was definitely on some sort of site, anyways. <laughs> uh, but the mechanics I did know about was this purple tether here. You're actually able to run it to the pillars on the side of the room, and if you do that, um, it won't do damage to you. And it does a fair bit of damage. I didn't realize it was going to do that much damage, but he almost got one-shotted by it. So um, I was definitely ready to do that if it came up. It didn't, so I kind of got lucky and probably would have been fine. But it was the that was the main mechanic I was aware of with this one. That's kind of what I do when I look up fights, um, unless it's like a really hard hardcore group or something like that, and I actually need to know every little little aspect of it. But just for general dungeon runs. If I'm going to look up fights, I'm just going to look up some of the, the basic stuff. Like the, there's usually a main gimmick for each fight, right? And if you know what to do, you're probably going to be okay. So that's that's mostly what I looked up. Uh, the other one is just making sure you kill the ad when it comes out. It'll generally target a random person. I think sometimes it targets the person who has the tether to them. I'm not entirely sure if that's true or not. Um, and then the other thing is just making sure you go in or out of the boss depending on the AOE damage. Uh, but that's pretty typical, don't stand in bad stuff. Uh, so those, those are kind of what I was paying attention to. Apart from that, I didn't notice too, too much. Um, I just sort of stayed away from stuff. And I'm pretty sure actually uh, they just tethered the uh, tether to a pillar. I just didn't see it as well from my angle. Uh, so there you go. But yeah, the other thing I've noticed while watching this is that I don't set focus to the bosses, which I'm, I'm super bad about now. I used to be so good on my healer. And it's just gotten worse and worse and worse. I think I do on the very final boss, but definitely on the first two, I just do not set focus. And I don't know what the deal is, uh, but yeah, that's that's unfortunate. I regret it, but we did all right. I think I did pretty good at keeping my cooldowns going too, but I'm still not using leaps as much as I can. Like whenever I watch this over, I'm like, ugh, there's so much time that I'm, I'm wasting that I could be using an attack of some sort. Uh, so it is, it's, it's super helpful, as I've mentioned before, to, to look at your own work, at your own play, your own gameplay. Uh, but yeah, let's continue on with our questions. Another one that I've been asked in a lot of videos is if I will do a live recording of the vault. Um, I will do that. A lot of people have requested that I do that because apparently the cutscenes afterwards are really, really interesting. Uh, so I'll definitely do that. Oh, here's, so we're inside kind of the cave area and this, like, it looks just beautiful in here. Like, look at this, like, glow coming from below. It looks so impressive. And I think it's just how massive these dungeons are. They kind of feel like the scape of raids in other games, but they are just four-person dungeons, so it feels really interesting to go through it. In this section, there's also some bosses, or some creatures, I should say, that are sleeping, and if we don't happen to kill creatures near them or engage with them, we actually don't need to take them. So I had some experienced people in the group kind of lead us through it without taking too many creatures, which was nice. But let's move on to our next question. Um, hypothetical crazy question. If there was, uh, if there were four of you all playing Final Fantasy XIV together, um, so I, I assume like I was four people, um, what would you, uh, what would be your tank, healer, and two DPS classes for a dungeon run? Uh, so that's kind of a difficult question because I actually have very little knowledge of all the different jobs at this point. Uh, but I'll go through what I kind of think I would do well at um, for tank. I have been enjoying the Dark Knight, uh, but I actually think the Pally, just based on how similar they are to other tanks I've played, would probably be my favorite, um, and I, I'm looking forward to trying that one day. Um, in terms of healers, just based on how cool they look, I'd choose Astro uh, Astrolo Astrologen. I'm sorry if I'm saying that wrong. I have some weird like words I just don't say well, so well, that's going to be one of them. If I ever play that job, it's going to be a rough time. <laughs> um, 
then I would say a Dragoon is one of my DPS. I really enjoyed it, and I think it's one of the coolest uh, close range DPS. And then I would choose probably a long range DPS as my other DPS, and I would be between the Summoner, which I have played a bit and really enjoy um, the playstyle, and I'm actually very interested to see that at a higher level with different summons, um, or a Black Mage, because I like the flashiness of their skills and they just get to blow stuff up, which sounds like fun. Uh, so that's probably what I'd do. There is another part to this question. Um, do you like pineapple on pizza? Um, I do. Um, I'll give a little bit more information. I actually really didn't like the idea of pineapple on pizza as a kid. Um, I was convinced to try it by my girlfriend, now wife, um, and I really do it. I uh, do enjoy it, and we've even ordered a pizza once that had nothing but cheese, sauce, and pineapple, so no ham or anything else. Uh, so I don't know if that's like the most horrible thing you've heard, or if you think that sounds delicious, but it's a truth. <laughs> it has happened. So there you go. I do like pineapple on pizza. I don't get it. Like, it's not the only type of pizza I get. I have to be in a particular mood for it, but it is good. So we're just progressing through some of these broodlings. Um, I'm just trying to like do AoE DPS. I find one of the issues I have with this is just waiting for like everything to get grouped up enough for me to actually do damage. <laughs> I kind of want to like blow everything before they're all grouped up and I, I'm sure that's not helpful to the tank. So I guess I, I just, I'm impatient is the, the, the key thing here. Uh, we probably have time for one more quick question before the boss. Uh, and someone said, is that a samurai quest I see? Um, yes, so I have confirmed actually in one of the comments on a past video, I am going to move forward with the samurai for the Stormblood expansion. I have started the quests. There will probably be a video about those quests and my progress soon enough. Uh, so yeah, it has started. All right, second boss. Very cool. Dragon again. I, I mean, as someone who loves dragons, this dungeon is just giving me everything that I ever wanted. It's it's pretty awesome. Uh, so we, we get into combat here. The main gimmick that I knew for this one is that there are going to be poison clouds on the ground and then a um, sort of yellow looking dude who goes and eats them. And I believe, I'm not sure if I actually remember this from the, the blog post I was reading, but certainly um, our healer, Nay, uh, says, you know, try to kill them after they eat two. Uh, which makes a lot of sense so that you can kind of like clear some of the gas clouds out. Um, if they eat three of them, I believe they blow up. We didn't, I think, have to see that, which is good, uh, because I don't know if it one-shots you or what the deal is. Yeah, so they're, they're mustard gas little dudes. Maybe they're green. I also have like issues with certain greens and colors, which <laughs> might be something you notice as we continue to play, uh, but yeah, it's, it's not great. <laughs> So I kind of jump on it a little bit too early, and then we just sort of leave it to eat up the rest of them and then kill it quickly afterwards, which I think is kind of nice. That way you're not panicking too much at the end. Uh, but that's that's the main thing. It's just kind of a, a repeat of that. Um, while the boss does do a fair bit of turns and you just have to avoid them, uh, I, don't, I don't think the poison cloud actually does that much damage either from... I don't know if I ran into it, um, which is what I mean. Like if I, if something does a lot of damage, you, you're usually pretty sure when you run into it and I just didn't, I didn't notice it. But maybe I'm just oblivious to it. <laughs> uh, so yeah, just a mix of this. I kind of wish I had ranged attacks for this because I, then I could um, you know, just blast the mustard gas when he got low without having to move around. But it is nice to have those leaps and stuff to kind of navigate between the boss and the mustard clouds. I also pulled off some sweet uh, back outs and jump ins with my leaps on this boss. It's, it's really nice when it has that mechanic and I'm I'm thinking quick enough to be able to use my skills because it does, it feels super cool when you pull it off, when you're like, oh yeah, I'm going to dodge this out and then I'm going to leap forward. It's really unfortunate when you use the wrong leap and do the one that kind of like just goes up down and you're locked in the, in the bad, but if you use the correct leap at the correct time, you feel pretty awesome as a Dragoon. Um, and I should warn people who are waiting for the Dragoon floor tank death, I don't think I die in this dungeon, so there's going to be some disappointed comments about that. Which I get, which I get. I mean, it might just be because I'm a Lalafell too, so I, I don't know. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so the, the boss went pretty well. Um, nothing too crazy, which is, I think, really nice for the leveling process. And I, I've said this in other videos too, 
the the difficulty for the dungeons is pretty tame. I'd say the trials are actually more difficult, which is fair because they're often labeled as like hard and brackets or whatever. Um, but the the dungeons themselves are pretty tame and more about the story and exploration. I'd say more than anything. So we move forward, we progress, um, we kind of go up these stairs into the the third area, I'd say, of this dungeon. Um, and what you'll see here is some really cool buildings and stuff that'll fall down as we're fighting, um, including one that will kind of, to the side here, you'll see we'll, we'll climb across it as a bridge. And I just love this. It really makes the, the world feel very interactive um, and, and really brings everything together. All right, let's get to another question. I'm curious if you were ever um, considering streaming on Twitch. Uh, I've noticed a lot of YouTubers would stream and chop up their VODs and post them on YouTube. I think it would be fun to interact with you. Uh, so yes, uh, streaming is something I've been considering more and more and more each day. It's something I'm actively nervous about because I don't know how to do. Um, and you've already seen that I'm a little bit hesitant when recording live, uh, but it's definitely something I'm trying to work and get more comfortable with. Um, and long story short, I think I would stream on YouTube probably just because I am partnered with YouTube and that way everything can be in one place. We don't have, you know, as much of a split amongst our community. Um, despite the fact I do like the style of um, sort of chopping up live streams into videos and I might still do that with YouTube. Uh, but it's, it's definitely where I think I would probably stream if I was going to. Um, and I do think I will try it. I, in the background, I'm actively working on uh, things and different pieces that I would need to try streaming. So that's that's slowly happening in the background. I have no uh, time frame on when I want to dive into that, but I will probably do like you know a big post on YouTube about it and probably schedule it beforehand so everyone knows when it's going to happen. Because obviously, I want to see as many of you as possible in the stream so we can talk and interact, and it would just be awesome. Uh, but yeah, good question. Um, and then the final question here, um, I do have one question for you, Chris, aside from Sid, because we all know you like him a lot, who were your favorite characters from ARR, um, whether they're still, whether they still appear in Heaven's Word or not, and why? Um, so I do like Sid, I've mentioned that a few times. Um, I like Alphano, actually, a lot. Um, I sometimes say he complains too much and he's too, like, mopey, but I, I really do enjoy it, and it's kind of a, a character you don't see as much in MMOs and video games. Like, he's kind of a flawed character, like where he makes a lot of mistakes, he's learning, he's young, right? That's the big thing here is he's quite young and he's making these mistakes. And you don't see that as often in games. And it pairs really well with some of the more mature people who know what they're doing, like Sid he pairs well with, and Astinian he pairs well with as well. So I've really enjoyed his company. Um, the other characters specifically from ARR um, that I don't believe we've seen yet in Heaven's Ward and might still be missing um, is uh, Papalaimo and Yida. Um, they're, I think, the first Scions that I get introduced to. I'm trying to think now, uh, but they're definitely characters that I remember a lot. Um, they have kind of their humor together um, with their different personalities, and I, and I really do appreciate that, and I think it works really, really well together. Um, and I've, I've missed them. It's actually been like long enough now that I'm like, ugh, I want to go talk to you guys about nonsense and like weird gathering quests again. <laughs> uh, so hopefully we do run into them again one day. Uh, but yeah, those are probably my favorite characters from A Realm Reborn. Um, and obviously we still get the play of Elf Node, which is awesome. Bonus part, my favorite character from Heaven's Word is probably Astinian. Uh, I get the most interaction with him because I'm a Dragoon as well, which is just awesome. Definitely worth the recommendation you guys gave me to play the Dragoon. Um, I, I've definitely enjoyed that as I go through the story. But yeah, so those are all the questions I had from the last video. If you do have other questions that you want me to include in a future dungeon run, uh, please add them to the questions or the comments below or any other video and I'll try and pick up on them. If I missed your question um, or you, you might have put it down before I went and collected them, uh, just keep adding them to future videos and I will try and get to it unless it's a question that's too personal and I don't want to answer it, um, which, you know, obviously that's that could be the case for some, but so far we haven't touched that. <laughs> uh, but yeah, keep them coming and hopefully one day we can answer them in live streams as well. I think that would be really exciting. Uh, my question for you guys actually is, does that you know live, live stream stuff I was talking about sound good? Um, would you be interested in, on, uh, on a stream on YouTube? Is that something like, cause I know a lot of people are very, um, you know, love Twitch, but I think YouTube just makes a lot of sense for us. All right, so we've made it to the end. We've got the big baddie here. 
Ugh, oh, the dragon models are just so cool. The eyeballs are just freaky. <laughs> uh, but yeah, let's uh, let's jump into it. So we've met up with Estinian here, and we're gonna fight. Alright, so we, we sort of catch up to Estinian, who's been, I guess, just like in a standstill with Nidhogg. Uh, pretty cool that we actually like get to go against Nidhogg. Uh, it's, it's one of those things where I was like, is this going to be just something that's talked about forever and we actually don't get to encounter, you know, the, the boss? A lot of MMOs tend to do that with their, their big baddies that, you know, they just kind of kind of appear and then they're like, oh, you can face my minion instead of actually facing me. But no, we get to go against the, the big baddie himself. It's interesting that it's in a dragon. Uh, or, sorry, in a dungeon. In a dragon. Got dragons on the mine, obviously. Um, I, I would have thought that perhaps he would have been in a trial or something with a, you know more characters to give that, that feeling of more importance. Uh, but I do get that the, the dungeon itself was a better way of kind of giving more story to it. Whereas a, a trial, they're usually done pretty quick, and it's just the the one boss, um, so you wouldn't have the build up as well as the other, you know, parts of this dungeon. So, I, I do get that. I got this target on me, and I was terrified. I kind of forgot the mechanics of this one a bit. I knew there was fireballs that we had to stand out of. When this happened to me, I was like, oh my god, what do I do? I'm pretty sure I just have to wait for the other DPS to break me out, and I don't think there was too much I could do to avoid it because it does have that target just over my head. If anything, I assume that maybe if you were too close to another person, they might also get trapped, but I'm not entirely sure of that either. Um, it might just be kind of signaling to the other DPS that, hey, this guy's about to get trapped, you should come help him. Uh, but yeah, he did a really good job of freeing me, so I, I appreciate it. Nay did a really good job of healing me, and we uh, we continue forward. I, I really enjoy the mechanic, and we see it in a few fights in Final Fantasy XIV where it'll summon those orbs, or it'll summon something on the ground, and then there will be a blast in different directions from them on the ground, and it really gives a really cool telegraph, uh, which I enjoy. So the other part of this fight, and this is the gimmick that I do remember from the blog that I, I, I read, is that the main thing is to try and protect his Sinian. If he dies, you, I'm pretty sure, wipe. Um, he can be healed from my, what I think, uh, though I'm not the healer, so I don't have as much information on that. Uh, but certainly killing the creatures that are trying to kill him is a good way to keep him alive. Um, and this final phase here is really where the boss kind of goes up into the sky and just summons his minions to try and take out Estinian and his powerful eyeball. Which is just such a weird part of the story that, like, it's eyes that hold a lot of the dragon's power. Like, it's it's a weird story. It's, it's cool. Like, it really is a really cool story. I've been appreciating all of Heaven's Word. But it's kind of weird that the eyes are like the source of the power and that like he's just got an eye in his pocket and that assumably we, we do as a dragon as well. So I, it's just it's kind of weird that way. Um, or at least I don't know if we have the eye. I think the, the lore is that we just get power from the eye as a dragon. I'm not entirely sure on that. Uh, he does summon this kind of final barrier to block us from this really cool fiery death attack that I'm sure would be a one shot if you're for some reason just standing out. Um, you don't have, uh, you have plenty of time, I was going to say, to just get into the shield though, so it would be pretty bad to die from that. <laughs> uh, but once we get out of here, we go back to doing some damage. He does a lot of AoE damage after this, um, though I also think we're kind of standing right in the front of the boss, which isn't good, um, kind of on us. And I also realized that, hey, I have the limit break attack. Um, I've been getting better at actually using them, as I am a, a close range DPS who should probably be using them. So whenever I do see the ability um, to do it, I, I try to. I might have waited a bit too long here. I also don't have it bound to anywhere that has a key, because I just, I, I don't know, I use it so infrequently, I'm like, I can just click this. But that might not be the best, the best either. <laughs> uh, so we don't actually kill Nidhogg. It's one of those really unsettling and unsatisfying things where he flies away to make trouble another day. Uh, but I get it, because, you know, like I said, it didn't feel epic enough at the time to be the time he died. So I'm interested to see what comes from him. But yeah, we'll jump into the final cutscenes in just one second here, and we'll talk about the story that unfolds after this dungeon. Alrighty, so here we are in the cutscene that happens after the dungeon. Um, there's quite a bit here, so uh, there's a lot to really process. 
And oh, wow, I already remember. I already made a mistake. Um, I said he, we don't kill Nidhog. Um, this is what happens to Nidhog. So I apologize for my comments like seconds ago in the video where I'm like he escapes to another day. Um, no, Estinian's got other other thoughts on that, and we get to see it play out right here, uh, which is super cool. And I think it makes a lot of sense because uh, you know Estinian's really had such a relationship with Nidhog. Oh, I love the dragon speak. So he's upset that we're attacking with his own essence, with the eye, right? <laughs> Which makes sense. It's like... Yeah, so very much um, Estinian's kind of final battle with him. Super cool. Like, just, if I wasn't already a Dragoon, watching this probably would convince me to become a Dragoon. I kind of, like, I get this is Estinian's fight, like I just said, but it's like, why are we just standing there as, <laughs> as he does this? Super cool. With the music, just very epic, too. Ugh. The crink, like the crack noise that's done is just, it's very well done. And down goes Nidhogg. Um, and now we see him sort of disappear into darkness, and I assume that's probably the death of Nidhogg. So it, it actually does happen. Uh, we just needed good old Estinian to do it. Ah, the epic music, I love it. Like, this is, you, you would become a dragoon. So. Yeah, he put the eyeball on the spear to stab it, which is... Like, is you the eyeball... You people a thousand years of suffering. Now I gift you an eternity in darkness. Super cool line. I was gonna ask, is the eyeball squishy and, like, wet? Or is it, like, more of a solid object? Probably not super important to the story, but I'm curious. So we have an echo that happens. Um, looks like we have a tummy ache, kind of. <laughs> um, and we got brought into this area. And I don't know if I've talked about this in Heaven's Sword yet, but we are collecting these crystals again, which were taken away from us or stripped from us. And I'm, I'm sort of still confused by how we're collecting these. Like, there's so many little stories going on in this game that it's it's kind of confusing um, as to what exactly this means. Um, and it's just the start of a few confusing things that are going to happen in a, in a row here. So we are having a flashback now, which you can tell just by the, the music, the sort of um, static of the screen, and the, the color that they choose. Like the, They've kept that very consistent, which makes it very obvious when you are having a flashback, uh, which I, I do appreciate. Got some, some uh, Lancers, maybe the Dragoons. <laughs> And then here's the big reveal. At least I think it's a big reveal. They are ours, Lord Haldrath. The eyes of Nidhogg. So Haldrath has the two eyes of Nidhogg. And he's the original Dragoon, from what I remember. Which is curious, because... Estinian only has one. Aye. The worm lies broken and my father is avenged. With the wellspring of his vitality thus denied him, Nidhogg should not linger long in this world. And then they say he shouldn't linger long, but he's obviously there for quite a while since we're fighting behold, him. Behold the terrible price we have paid. My sire is dead. So many brother knights slain. We traded our honor for the strength which now courses in our veins, and still we are forced to make such sacrifice. So it was a big fight. But not in vain, my lord. Krace Felger is the only great worm left in Dravania, and he dares not leave his lair. Which is so weird, because we went against Nidhogg. With Nidhogg's eyes in your possession, who now can challenge the might of Ishgard, ascend the throne? and take your rightful place as the ruler of our people. 
Now, there's some other characters here, and I'm, I'm, I apologize for not knowing exactly who they are. Um, I'm just happy that I remember who Haldreth is. At least I hope I'm correct. Nay, my friend. I must forsake the mantle of king. Though Nidhogg be defeated, his wormling horde yet darkens the skies with wings beyond counting. Yeah, so he still has a lot of minions. As one who partook of Ratatoska's strength, it shall be my penance to bear a knight's arms until death grants me leave to retire. When that day comes, no prince shall perish, but a hell's bound hunter of dragons. So he's saying his role is to hunt them down instead of being king. But Lord Haldreth, what then shall become of the royal line? Think of your people, my lord. Without a king, who will the common man turn to in his hour of need? How will he find his way without your benevolent hand to guide him? I mean, Dragon Hunter might be more important than king in terms of people, but I, I don't know. I don't know. I thank you, Sir Flavian and Sir Silvertrill, for dispelling my remaining doubts. With men of such wisdom and compassion in service to the realm, it is plain that Ishgard has no need of a king. But if you must bow to the demands of tradition, you need look no further than yourselves for one worthy to wear the crown. I appreciate that this is voiced. It really does add a lot to this. God, your goons are just always awesome. In terms of, like, style. Fare thee well, my brother knights. My loyal friends. On these shoulders shall I bear the weight of my father's sins. With this lance, shall I repay the debt accrued through our misdeeds. So I don't know if he's talking like sins as in like that they started this kind of fight and now he's like gonna go finish it or what the deal is. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of questions there. What cruel jest has fate played upon us? Have we seized this desperate victory only to lose a king? We can but act as our lord has bid. We few who remain must divide between us the rulership of Ishgard and her people. Not I. My oath was to Lord Haldrath and he alone. If he is not to be king, then I would hang up my shield as well. So this guy's not having any of it. Will you abandon us too, sir? I would wash my hands of blood and betrayal and take up an honest trade. Mayhap I shall serve ale instead of sharpened steel. It's a fair trade. Sharp, uh, serving ale. I like it. This guy's got his priorities. Yeah, I don't know. It's just, it's... Like, I feel like I should know more of these characters. We four, then. And I apologize if I should, and I'm just Fortin. ridiculous. Hylanat. Dirinder. And Zemai. Just some normal names. But four houses to rule all of Ishgard. And what of the throne? We keep it empty. Until the day a king rises once more, we must assume the role of stewards. We shall shape our nation anew with a history of our own making, and let the truth of this dark day die here, upon the battlefield. It is cool that we get such a background to the shaping of Ishgard and like the situation we're in. Like this, this reveals a lot. It's just almost too much information to, to fully process yet. So we come out of our our situation. It always looks like we're having like stomach issues, and our friends are always like, "What's wrong?" <laughs> what ails you, friend? Are you wounded? No, just having weird visions again. to history 
to the culmination of the first battle with Nidhogg. Yeah, so that's the first battle with Nidhogg. The legend of Ishgard's founding tells that our ancestors were led to the land of Kurthus by the valiant King Thordon. In the midst of their journey, they came to a wide chasm where they were set upon by a great worm, Nidhogg. A furious battle then ensued, with Thordon leading the van. So that's the original story. Though the brave king was slain defending his people, his son, Haldrath, the first Azure oh, I was correct. fought on undaunted. Where? What? And with a mighty thrust of his lance, he gouged out Nidhogg's eye, forcing the wicked creature into retreat. Thus, did this eldritch orb become a sacred treasure of Ishgard, lending its power to every knight deemed worthy to bear the title of Azure Dragoon. Oh, so was the eye not stuck to the spear, but he pulled out an eye? A rousing tale, is it not? Would that I could still believe it. But your vision, which we must accept as immutable truth, leaves no room for doubt. So I like how we have to accept it as truth, no matter what. If Haldrath took both of Nidhogg's eyes, then how came this eye to be lodged in the worm's skull? Yeah, okay, so it was in his skull. Okay, I was confused by that. Do we get to keep an eye? Yeah, like how big it is compared to us. Gross. Beneath every answer we unearth. Another question lies oh, buried. that's such the theme of this game. You get one step forward, a million steps back in terms of trying to understand everything that's going on. But I love it. All right, guys, thanks for watching this video. If you can help me understand what's going on in this story, that would be appreciated. I really enjoyed the dungeon, though. Um, really enjoyed our encounter with Nidhogg. I think it was very fitting, um, and I think very fitting that you know, Estinian had the, the final blow too. I think he's been waiting for a while to get that. But yeah, thanks for watching guys. I'll see you in the next video.